Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture with your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald J. Brown. Our topic for today is the man who invented the department store, A.T. Stewart. One of the most fascinating New Yorkers, a lot of people don't know about him, but he is one of those great success stories of the United States. An immigrant arrived at a right time, a good time, and then made a fortune. And the picture you see on the right, that's in Garden City on Long Island. That's at the train station. And that is the bust of A.T. Stewart. So let's get going on our discovery of a fascinating New Yorker. First is early life. And then what was shopping like in the 1840s? Very different from today, where everybody drives to a mall, as they would do in Garden City. And then what did S.A.T. Stewart contribute to the shopping experience? Founding of his own town, Garden City, the rather bizarre case of his funeral and burials, and then the tragic decline and the fall of Stuart legacy. So let's get going. The early life of A.T. Stewart. He was born in 1803. Well, that was shortly after the revolutionary period and all of the chaos. And it was a beginning of a period of great migration. If we look at the graph, we see 1820s was the beginning of the great period of migration. Predominantly English, Scotch, Irish, predominantly Protestant. But by the 1840s, huge numbers of Germans, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish started migrating. And of course, the Irish Catholics started migrating because of the Great Potato Famine. Well, A.T. Stewart was a Protestant, uh, one of the Irish settlers, or one of the English settlers who had been moved to Ireland to control the country, which was then under English occupation. Also, the period of A.T. Stewart shows that the population of the United States was booming. 2.8 million in 1780 at the time of the revolution, and then up to 23 million by 1850. So it was an exciting time to be in New York. New York was growing by leaps and bounds. The little Dutch town that we see at the bottom with about 20, 23,000 uh, people by the time of the revolution burst through the city wall and became Wall Street. And then the English and the Scotch and the Germans started uh, um, expanding the city. On the right, we see the growth of the city by 1850 where you see Wall Street, that little area at the very bottom, below the number two that you see, that was basically the Dutch town. And then the English and other immigrants started moving in, laying out neighborhoods. Brooklyn began to grow as an independent city. And the city of Manhattan, which was New York at the time, started growing north reaching 14th Street, and that's where the famous grid plan comes into play. Below that, there were isolated neighborhoods, each with their grid plan to some extent, uh, but not following a laid out plan. But by the time you get to 14th Street 
and above 14th Street, it is the regular avenue and street that we all recognize as the New York grid plan. Well, he arrived in New York, Alexander Turney Stewart. Everybody calls him AT. Nobody even, most people don't even know what AT stands for, but now you do. He arrived in 1823, the beginning of the Protestant Northern European migration, as a 20 year old young guy, in the typical age of immigration. There was no future in Ireland or England, he thought, and so it's best just to try his luck in the new world. He inherited some money from his grandfather, so he was not an impoverished immigrant like we think of so many of the other immigrants. Uh, you know, he had the advantage of speaking English, he had the advantage of being Protestant in an overwhelmingly Protestant city, and he was um, educated, could read and write, had a good business sense. So he was really preparing for greatness. Well, at about that same time, my ancestors were coming over. Here we see Frederick Georg Bayer and his wife. And on the right, you see uh, with his wife, Maria Anna Long. And these were the types of immigrants who were coming over in the 1820s and 30s. Many of them, like the Byers and the Longs, were farmers from Germany and brought some money with them and were able to buy land in rural Pennsylvania and set up in the farming area of Altoona Johnstown area. So A.T. Stewart was part of this big wave of migration. Other immigrants who made good were Johann August Röbling, who designed and built the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, Heinrich Engelhard Steinweg, who we know as Henry Steinway, ended up being famous for his uh, uh, grand pianos. So many of these new immigrants came with a little bit of money, with some education, and achieved success in the new world. Well, the Stewart family had been involved in lace and linen business, basically cloth, whether it was uh, clothing, curtains, bedding, gowns, tablecloths, decorations, baby clothes, veils for women. This was a big business. And as you can see from the book on the right, uh, uh, crocheting and lace making was a labor intensive job, but yet women wanted it. It was a sign of success to have a lace tablecloth, to have little doilies on your um, couches and on your chairs. Many people covered their walls with cloth rather than wallpaper or paint. They would cover them with cloth and very often there'd be a cotton batting behind it. Plus, women wore these long gowns down to the floor with layers and layers of petticoats. And it was a very, very successful industry and in great demand. This is the kind of house that people would have lived in at the time. Um, um, Another successful person was F.A.O. Schwartz, who got into children's toys and uh, home decorations. People drank tea. They loved little candy shops. Uh, um, uh, everybody went shopping. But you had to go to a store for furniture. You had to go to a store for cloth. You had to go to a different store for tea and coffee, a different store for every type of thing, the shoe store, the hat store. 
Well, gradually, certain people decided that it was crazy to have all these individual stores. For example, Schwartz had a toy store, and you went there to buy your toys. Well, everything in the picture on the right had to be bought at a different place. We see the paintings, we see the lights, we see the couches, the tea setting, the carpet, the furniture, the toys. Everything had to be bought at a different location. Well, A.T. Stewart began rather modestly, and his first store was on 283 Broadway. Here we see it in the middle of the picture, A.T. Stewart. And next to it is Tiffany and Young. And so every little store specialized in one thing or the other. And he started selling lace goods and clo cloth uh, at his modest store in 1823, using the money he inherited from his uh, grandfather. Well, shopping in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s was a rather chaotic business. Winter and summer, you had to be running from store to store. The main shopping street was Lower Broadway, which was in the 1840s, the main drag of the city. The well-to-do people lived there. Government offices were there. Banks were down um, Wall Street, which intersects with Broadway. And so it was lined with stores, such as on the right, you see Davidson, Watson, Wittenfeld, Courier, Hosiery and Clothes, Bottle, Pottery. Every shop was a different specialization. You had your boot and shoe store. You had your women's clothing. You had your men's hat store. You had your bakery. You had a, uh, a store for cooking pots, these old cast iron uh, skillets and cooking pots. You went from shore store to store to do your shopping. Rain or snow or sleet or heat, you had to do your shopping. And it was a daily event. I mean, bread had to be bought every morning. In the 1830s, there were no great refrigerators. You bought your meat fresh just before the meal and hoping that the meat hadn't been hanging around for a couple of days. And so you went out to buy your bread. The French still do that. They go out in the morning to get your baguette. When I go to Paris, I stay with my friend Pierre. And it's always my job to get up early in the morning make the coffee, and then run out and pick up the baguette or the croissant that we're going to have. And very often it's still warm from the bakery, which is a tiny establishment just across the street. Brooks Brothers was another successful business establishment at about the same time as A.T. Stewart. And here we see Brooks Clothing Store on Catherine Street in New York. And we see the uh, uh, various little businesses, uh, uh, each one specializing. Brooks Brothers uh, exploded as a very successful business during the Civil War when they got the contract to make uh, uniforms for officers uh, in the Northern Army. Even the officers in the Southern states, the Confederate states, lusted after Brooks Brothers clothing. Abraham Lincoln, when he was assassinated, was wearing a Brooks Brothers coat. Tiffany, which was in New York since 1837. Again, we see the Tiffany and Young store specializing in home furnishings, paintings, lights, uh, dishes, silverware, and uh, carpets. And so this was another successful independent store. 
Well, shopping was no pleasure because many of the streets of New York in the 1830s were not yet paved. Since oysters were a great and a cheap delight, people would simply throw the shells on the streets and they would be crushed and they'd form a layer of uh, pavement over the mud. Sidewalks were very often rickety wooden things built in front of the store with boards rotting and uh, getting slippery with dirt. The streets themselves were covered with uh, garbage, since there was no garbage disposal. The horses eat grass and we know it comes out the other side. But gradually, the city started paving its stone. The famous cobblestones would be brought back from Europe and uh, they would be inserted into the streets. And many of these you can still see in lower Manhattan. It, it was bef long before they used cement or uh, asphalt to make uh, paving. It was cobblestone streets. Well, this chaotic shopping experience uh, was a challenge for A.T. Stewart. He opened his big marble palace in 1848. And we see a picture, an advertisement, New York City processions passing Stewart's marble palace. And we see that everybody is in horses and buggies. It was a marble clad building. And it was the first store to bring all of the independent stores under one roof. So you could go into A.T. Stewart and you could get your shoes, you could have a cup of tea, a woman could look at the hats. Men could check out the suits or the canes or the top hats. Uh, and you could furnish your house. And everything was available under one roof. It is still standing. There's a picture of me at 280 Broadway. Uh, it became eventually the Sun newspaper building. And it remains and nice and clean and gleaming white marble. And this was the cradle of the department store. Brought everything under one roof. So you didn't have to run through the mud and the dirt and the rain or the snow or the storms to do your shopping. His second big store was <clears throat> the Iron Palace, which he built during the Civil War. Don't forget, civil wars are good business. Uh, wars are good business, except for those soldiers who get killed, but other people make a fortune. And A.T. Stewart did. This was his Iron Palace, cast iron building, no longer marble, even though it looks like marble columns, but they are all made out of iron. This was the, up further up Broadway at 10th Street. It was demolished in 1956, but this became an even larger and more luxurious uh, shopping experience. It's interesting to look at the transportation. You see this building made of iron, very modern. One, two, three, four, five stories tall. And in front of it are horses and buggies. And on the left, you see a trolley. So it was his second big shopping metropolis. Inside, there were 30 different departments. That's where we get the name department store. Silks, dress goods, carpets, toys, bedding, upholstery, shoes, hats, belts. Everything imaginable was in one department. It was an open area in the middle where people would stroll around, do their shopping, 
irrespective of the elements. So it was really a revolution. The next big revolution would, of course, be with the invention of the automobile and Robert Moses building his parkways and highways. The next big revolution was the mall outside the city, because then you could go in your car, park it in the giant parking lot, and then spend the whole day in the mall, which could contain theaters, restaurants, bookstores, you name it. But in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, uh, there were no cars. And so the shopping was in the inner city shopping area. Well, Broadway between six between Broadway and 6th Avenue, between 9th and 23rd Street, became known as Ladies Mile. Many other stores started building department stores. Macy's, which is still standing, B. Altman, which is still standing, Lord and Taylor. These are all big stores that started imitating the uh, success of A.T. Stewart. So Broadway became the shopping center of the city. Many of the stores also branched out into a new form of marketing, and this was the mail order business. We know Sears and Roebuck catalog. We have others from um, selling almost everything. Coffee and toast are better when prepared electrically, advertising the new electric toaster. I collect toasters, that one at the top in the upper right-hand corner with the old cord. I must have 20 of those for my collection of about 50. In the middle, I have that one as well, which um, is a different kind of toaster. I have the um, coffee and tea services in this, in this picture. I mean, almost everything I have copies of. I don't have the clothing that was being sold, but here you see how lavishly women dressed. And they had to have a lot of clothes because if it was a muddy day and the woman had her dress down to her shoes, She'd get home and she'd have to change her clothes and it had to be literally taken apart and washed separately by hand and then dried and ironed. And a woman might go uh, well to do where even a middle class woman would uh, go through four or five outfits in a day. The expression, we have to dress for dinner. Or in old-fashioned movies, you see people getting back from a picnic or something and saying, okay, we're going up to dress for dinner, a whole new outfit. And of course, the woman couldn't wear the same outfit repeatedly. So she had to uh, vary her wardrobe, add a shawl or something, uh, which again made women's shopping a major ordeal. <clears throat> Various wealthy people built their homes on Fifth Avenue. Here we see the A.T. Stewart Mansion featuring its mansard roof, which was all the rage in Paris, invented by Monsieur Monsard, because the top floor was not considered a floor. This building had officially three floors and it had an attic because the attic was under the roof tiles. And even if there were rooms up there, and very often that's where the servants lived in a mansion like this, uh, but it was not taxed as a floor because it was literally an attic under the roof. 
He built this mansion in 1869 when those people who had made fortunes during the Civil War started building their palatial residences on Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue was a residential area around Washington Square uh, and slowly creeping up Fifth Avenue. It was the residential area. Business area was still on Broadway. The insides were lavish. All these wealthy people um, would buy from um, F.A.O. Schwartz, from Tiffany, Brooks Brothers, and furnishing a palatial home like this was a major endeavor. <clears throat> the bedrooms with all of their curtains, layers of curtains and carpets and bedding, a tea set um, from Tiffany with uh, um, all kinds of furniture and lamps, stucco decorations around the ceilings, and uh, all kinds of urns and busts and paintings. Uh, this is what A.T. Stewart was providing for the growing Fifth Avenue wealthy elite. This atmosphere is very much captured by the HBO film, I think it was HBO, yes, The Gilded Age, showing the rivalry between upstart wealthy people like A.T. Stewart and the Vanderbilts, who made a fortune in the Civil War, and the old money people, such as the Astors. These were the people who went to war, arguing who should be invited to Mrs. Astor's ball, who should be excluded. And the clash of the two women in the HBO series um, confronts Mrs. Astor on the left with Mrs. Vanderbilt on the right, who was going to be included and who was going to be excluded. And so the Vanderbilts built their house just across the street from Mrs. Astor's mansion. And the film really portrays the vicious rivalry between new money and old money in New York. Well, the new money people were violating one of the rules of New York City. One of the rules was old families, old Protestant families lived first in stately brownstones and didn't publicly display their wealth. Whereas the new people, such as A.T. Stewart, such as the Vanderbilt, such as Clark family from my Southwest, who made their fortune in the copper business, came to New York, built mansions, which not only had mansard roofs, but literally sculptures over the entrance, flaunting their wealth, the gaudy marble mansions. We see that a bit today with Donald Trump. Immigrants from Germany made good, plastering his name all over everything and letting the world know that he is now among the greats of New York City, still shunned by any respectable club or any respectable institution, which considered him to be an upstart, gaudy, vulgar, such as people considered A.T. Stewart, such as they considered the Vanderbilts as upstarts, no class, no quality, like the Astors had, or the Stuyvesant. 
Well, eventually the Astors fell into the rage for palatial mansions. Here we see the 65th and 5th Avenue Astor Mansion. There with a pronounced gaudy sculptures on the outside of the building, the mansard roof, the interior filled with paintings. Look at the size of that fireplace. Furniture showing your wealth was what Fifth Avenue was all about. Well, in addition to his remaining marble palace and his long destroyed mansion on Fifth Avenue, and in addition to revolutionizing doing shopping in New York City, A.T. Stewart decided to build his own city. And this was very much the rage. Not far from where I live is the Forest Hills planned settlement. And this was Forest Hills Gardens. And so when A.T. Stewart came up with the idea of a garden city, this is precisely what he had in mind, building a utopia, a perfectly planned, beautiful city. And Long Island became prime real estate for these uh, utopias, whether it is Forest Hills Gardens, planned, private, uh, uh, gated community, or some of the other ones uh, covered well in the book Gardens of Eden by Robert McKay. <clears throat> Garden City was going to be a planned city. It was going to be for upper middle class people. Most New Yorkers were working in factories. Here we see a textile factory where women sitting and sewing, and we see the gentlemen, the managers, the overseers, even the owners. And A.T. Stewart wanted to attract these people to his garden city. It was the exact opposite of the slums of the city, the tenements where most people lived. Like Forest Hills Gardens, it was going to be marked as a garden community where you had your house, you had a front yard, you had a backyard. Most of these were restricted to good quality Protestants. Catholics and Jews were largely, um, not, if not outright banned, uh, um, it was for good quality Protestants. Forest Hills Gardens has three churches inside the community, and all three are Protestant. Later on, when Catholics started moving in, they built their churches out on Queens Boulevard. So Garden City started taking shape in 1869. Um, and the Garden City, a book by uh, C.B. Purdom, um, um, describes the goals of this new living experience. Well, it was more than just a planned um, neighborhood. It was linked to the city, to Manhattan, with the branch of the Long Island Railroad. So you see in the book, Garden City, 1876, you see the train going through. So you could live in the Garden City, jump on the train, go into Manhattan, go to your factory, your bank, your business, or go shopping at A.T. Stewart's or Macy's or wherever. It also included the cathedral for the Episcopal Diocese of Long Island. And he funded the building of this massive cathedral on a hill uh, with a residence for the bishop. 
In fact, A.T. Stewart, as we're going to see later on, um, is buried in the crypt. But then some people say he is not. That's going to be the topic for a couple of minutes. But here at, at any stone, um, in memory of A.T. Stewart, this building has been erected by his widow, Cornelia M. Stewart, who continued the construction of this ideal uh, community um, in uh, after his death or deaths. Here we see a map of the Garden City, the layout. Uh, we see the cathedral and the green area surrounding it uh, and the blocks and a grid plan with the railroad coming down from the top down to the bottom of the picture. Uh, and so it was uh, planned individual homes, no apartments. The well-to-do people built their individual houses very much in the Tudor style, which was so popular at the time, which was also the architecture of Forest Hills Gardens. Forest Hills Gardens which was, was much more strict on building uh, uniformity, whereas Garden City let every owner um, build to his or her delight. These are some of the mansions which are still standing. The one in the upper left is the palace for the uh, bishop of the Long Island Diocese. The houses back then usually had porches, the older ones, such as the one on the bottom left, because there was no air conditioning. Uh, you see the lawns, some of them have fountains, and they gradually, over the years, grew more and more elegant, finally, with the age of air conditioning and fans, uh, doing away with the front porch, because you people would stay inside. But each one is unique and distinct in its own style. This was his utopia. This is the Long Island Railroad Station in Garden City. And same building is still there. It is the today the Hampstead branch of Long Island. And you see in the right, it goes the whole way out to Babylon. Uh, and then it goes in through Farmingdale, goes through Levittown, another later planned neighborhood built after um, or between the wars and after World War II, going through Garden City, Floral Park, the Stewart Manor, uh, South Floral Park, Elmont, and then into uh, Jamaica, Queens, where uh, the train then continues into Manhattan. And so this was a, um, a, a really a well-planned um, and well-documented city. <clears throat> this is the uh, interior of the train station. We can see Garden City, 1898. And, um, and a mosaic on the floor, the old fireplace. There was no electric heating back then. You see the rather modern benches, but it's been well preserved and well restored. Outside in the parking lot is the bust of A.T. Stewart. That's me standing there um, on a recent visit. Uh, it was erected in 1869 uh, to honor uh, one of these great New Yorkers. The Garden City also had its famous Garden City Hotel, 1874, because the wealthy people on the weekends and on free days wanted to play golf. On the right is the modern building for the Garden City Casino, which has all kinds of events. The Garden City Golf Club was located in the hotel, 
And once again, you see the big front porches with the awnings that come down because there were no central air conditioning and the city, New York, got very hot in the summer. St. Paul's Episcopal School, um, the building, I understand, still exists. And well, last I, I was talking to somebody from Garden City saying they don't know what to do with this massive building. But this was the boys' school. And this was the President Trump's family school. His uncle, Fred Trump Jr. and Robert Trump are all alumni of St. Paul's School. Donald Trump didn't go there uh, because he was a problem child and his father sent him to military academy to try to tame him down. But the rest of the family attended St. Paul's Episcopal uh, School. It closed down in 1991. The Cathedral School of St. Mary built in 1893, was the girls' equivalent of the St. Paul's School for Boys. And of course, these were academic schools. I went to a school like this for my high school, and of course, Latin was required every year. Uh, we had to take it, and uh, we had to do a year, year of classical Greek. And then we were allowed to take a foreign language. I did three years of German. And uh, we did all the other academic, rigid academics um, um, topics. And then, of course, it was assumed that everyone would go on to one of the Ivy League schools. As you can see, uh, originally um, uh, it was for Episcopalians only, uh, gradually uh, letting in outside people, uh, but still it remained its elitist character. Now, the funeral and burials, another exciting chapter in the A.T. Stewart saga. Well, famous people like to have nice burials. A.T. Stewart died April 10th, 1876, at the age of 73. And like his predecessor, Peter Stuyvesant, who wanted to be laid to rest in a dignified manner, um, A.T. Stewart made plans for his funeral. Here we see the tombstone of Peter Stuyvesant, which is in a crypt underneath St. Paul's Church in the Bowery in Manhattan. And it says where Peter Stuyvesant was buried. And this is what respectable people do. And so A.T. Stewart made plans for his burial. Career of the Merchant Prince. He dies in his residence on Fifth Avenue Mansion. His birth and early life, the secret of his success, incidents, wealth, personal habits, the last days, Mrs. Stewart's affair at the clubs and the funeral. Belonging to the right clubs was a sign of arriving in New York society. And death uh, announcements like this, obituaries, always listed the clubs that he was invited to join. The University Club, the um, uh, other ones, Metropolitan Club, the, uh, As uh, the uh, Knickerbocker Club. These were all the great clubs that you couldn't apply for. You had to be invited to join. Well, the coffin handles from the casket. Hmm. What does this mean? Well, it meant first that he had an ornate casket. It was no pine box for him. 
But why would the handles be preserved in this way? Well, this is the saga of Pete, of the burial. Well, he was buried in a family vault and in St. Mark's in the Bowery Cemetery, where Peter Stuyvesant and other famous New Yorkers were buried. And here we see uh, one of the typical stones that would be raised and he would then be buried underground in a vault. Sometimes you had to go down several stairs uh, after you opened the vault, and it was usually well secured. He was buried in his family vault, which contained two of their uh, children that died. His mother and a niece were buried there, and he was added. It went 12 feet underground. So it was a rather secure burial, since tomb robbers uh, uh, were not limited to just ancient Egyptian tombs, but they were happen happening everywhere. Well, on November 7th, it was discovered that the crypt had been looted. The body was gone. Well, a demand was made for $20,000. For two years and six months and 24 days, the negotiations drug on. Eventually, his wife agreed to pay the ransom, which we assume was $20,000. Well, the body was returned and it could not really be identified because it had so deteriorated that they were never really sure that it was his body. But None again, it was assumed. He was reburied in the crypt underneath his new cathedral. And legend has it that if his tomb is ever tampered with, uh, the bells of the church will begin to ring. So this is one of these legends. Well, the tomb of uh, the original tomb is still in St. Mark's in the Bowery. Um, and it is um, still uh, one of the tombs in the uh, St. Mark's in the Bowery. It is one of the ghost stories or one of the mystery stories of St. Mark's in the Bowery. It is believed that every year at Christmas, the ghost of Peter Stuyvesant marches out of his crypt and roams around the city. One of those great stories of cemeteries, tombs that people love. In 1882, a puck cartoon shows the ghost of A.T. Stewart searching for his body. And Henry Hilton posts signs on Stewart's property. So Henry Hilton was the executor of the Stewart estate. And it is believed that he was the one who lost the A.T. Stewart estates, that he was a thief. And so the story goes on of what happened to not just A.T. Stewart's body, but what happened to his money. 
So the mystery surrounding his death remains a mystery. Some people say that his body was taken simply tomb robbers, seeing the jewelry, taking anything of value, and that was a very common procedure. Other people say that it was not just a tomb robber, but it was all of these little shopkeepers who people like A.T. Stewart put out of business. You wanted a card printed, you went to A.T. Stewart's. You wanted furniture, you didn't go to a carpenter, you went to A.T. Stewart. House and sign paintings, you could do it at A.T. Stewart. So, the mystery of A.T. Stewart, who stole his body. Many people even accused Henry Hilton of stealing the body of his former employer to get even more money from the A.T. Stewart fortune. Until today, we don't know who did it. Well, Hilton eventually dissipated the entire fortune of the um, A.T. Stewart family. Um, a book by Stephen Elias, uh, A.T. Stewart, The Forgotten Merchant Prince. His Iron Palace was bought by Wanamakers in 1896, and it burned down in 1956. And that was very much the end of the A.T. Stewart dynasty. The name survives. We see Stewart Avenue um, in um, on Long Island. The Long Island um, Railroad go, crosses over Stewart Avenue. The manse or the house of the art of the bishop still stands. The cathedral still stands. These are two isolated buildings on a little, rather barren. Um, um, hill uh, in Garden City. Schools were closed and uh, some, the uh, girls' school was demolished. Uh, as I said earlier, I think the boys' school is still standing. In fact, I'm going to have to go out there and check it out and not knowing what to do with the building itself. Well, the Garden City is still standing, but unfortunately, the Diocese of Long Island, which A.T. Stewart had really adopted as his special religious project, uh, um, is now bankrupt. On October 2020, it went bankrupt because of so many um, clergy sex abuses. And uh, the diocese had paid out a total of 62 million to 350 survivors, but there were still many, about that many more survivors who could not be paid because the diocese was in bankruptcy. The mansion, A.T. Stewart's mansion on Fifth Avenue was demolished in 1901. And we can see the, one of the few pictures of the inside showing the statuary, the lamps, uh, the and chandeliers, carpets, tables, chairs. Uh, it must have been quite a yard sale when uh, it was demolished. Most of the mansions along Fifth Avenue have been demolished uh, and made make way for giant skyscrapers. Uh, a couple of them remain, but walking up Fifth Avenue every once in a while, you'll stumble upon um, one squeeze between two skyscrapers or sometimes on a corner of the Fifth Avenue and a street going to the east, you will see one of the remaining mansions. The name remains 
Um, there's Stuart Avenue in Garden City. See a rather modern house, uh, Stuart House, uh, an apartment uh, building in Garden City, or new one. Um, welcome to the village of Garden City. It is not legally incorporated as a city or as a town, but many places on Long Island have sort of a certain status. Like when you go to Forest Hills Gardens, you see immediately that the street signs are not New York style street signs. And so it maintains uh, its um, independence uh, as either a city or as a village or some other um, status. So once again, uh, you'd like to Give me some feedback, ronbrownmedia at gmail.com. There's again me standing beside the bust of A.T. Stewart in Garden City. So this story, the saga of A.T. Stewart, is very much a chapter in the Gilded Age. Gilded, today we would use the word gold-plated, meaning a thin layer of gold overlying some other base metal, copper, iron, who knows? Well, it showed that A.T. Stewart, a rather nondescript immigrant, made good and became one of the members of the new rich of the Gilded Age in constant conflict to claim his status as one of the great New York um, um, multimillionaires, uh, Gilded Age, great people. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the talk, and I hope to see you sometime in the future. This is Dr. Ronald Brown signing off and saying, have a good day.